Good afternoon, and we welcome you to RACPRO's session, Exploring Colleges. I'm sorry, that is the wrong session. We are talking about the holistic, decoding the college admissions process, holistic review, test optional, affordability, and more. Um, a few housekeeping rules. Um, you will ask questions today using the Q&A button. You will type your questions and the to the presenters at any time. We ask you if your, micro, your microphone and cameras are off and you are muted. So you will just be able to ask questions with the Q&A. We wanna remind you to sign up for additional sessions. This is just one of many presentations being offered. You can check out the schedule here at www.strivescan.com backslash Virginia. And finally, there will be a recording available after the session, so you don't have to take notes. If or if you're not able to take notes, we will have a recording available for you. So at this time, I will turn our session over to our wonderful panelists. Thank you and welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for today's program. Uh, my name is Ashley Browning and I'm Vice President for Enrollment Management at Hollins University. I'm delighted to have my colleagues with me from Bruno College, Shenandoah University, and Hampton Sydney College. Um, for the format of today's program, we are going to begin with um, introductions and a campus overview. So you'll hear from each of us with a brief one to two minute overview of, of what we have to offer on our campuses. And then we're gonna move right into the meat of our program, specific, specifically talking about holistic review. That's kind of a loaded term, what does it mean? Um, test optional, especially in the era of COVID-19. I'm sure you have many questions about that. Um, we'll talk about affordability. All the schools on the line today are private universities. And so we wanna help you understand how you can um, finance and afford private education. And then we'll close with an opportunity to ask your questions. So we hope you'll use the chat, uh, the Q&A feature as we go through and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, so I'll kick things off. Um, as I said, I'm with Hollins University. We're located in Roanoke, Virginia. You can see it's a beautiful area. We're very fortunate um, in regards to the beauty of our campus. The first thing you need to know about Hollins is that we are all about women empowering women. We are a women's college at the undergraduate level and we do offer co-ed graduate programs. Uh, we're also a small place. We're a place where it's all about you being a name and not a number. So our student to faculty ratio is nine to one. We have a very engaged student body. 80% of our students complete an internship before graduation and 50% actually complete more than one. So if you're looking for a place that's really going to help you support your academic experience with um, some kind of resume building experiences, Hollins can be a good fit for you. Um, 43% of our undergraduate population is from Virginia. So lots of students here from the Commonwealth. Um, second most popular state is North Carolina. And then we spread across, across the country and across the world. So um, for a small place, we have exceptional diversity. You can see there 36% students of color, which is pretty phenomenal for a small place. Um, having a diverse student body is something that's so important to us here at Hollins. And we really believe that those diverse perspectives add immense value to your undergraduate experience. So we're very proud of that. Um, Hollins is a very welcoming place. Our top majors are um, English and Creative Writing, Biology, Psychology, Art, and Business. So a real nice spread across a traditional liberal arts and sciences curriculum, lots of depth and breadth. It's not uncommon at all for a biology major to be our lead in the theater production. So we want you to get to celebrate all of your interests while you're here. We do compete in the Old Dominion Athletic Conference. That's something that a few of us here have in common. Um, Hollins also is home to uh, a nationally renowned equestrian riding program. So the barn's right here on campus. Um, lessons early in the morning are a normal part of life for our students. Uh, so it's pretty amazing to get to walk up for your lesson and um, be there in less than five minutes for students. Um, as a small place, um, you'll find that People who attend a small school, and in particular a small women's school, are really committed to the experience that they had. And we were really proud to be ranked by the Princeton Review as the top five best alumni network and the top 21 best schools for internships. Those are, are two things that I think are really representative of the way that our alumni believe in this experience and want to ensure that um, the same opportunities they had while they were here are afforded to you as a current student. 
Um, lastly, we have a terrific scholarship guarantee here at Hollins. Every admitted student is guaranteed at least $24,000 in academic merit scholarship. That's a huge amount of money. We'll talk more about affordability um, at the end, but I think we can really help uh, make you feel more comfortable about how you can make private education affordable. Uh, and lastly, we'd love to see you on our Instagram channel. Um, it's just at Holland's Admission on Instagram. We do some fun student takeovers, reminder about webinars that we have coming up, and it's a great way for you to submit questions too. So I will turn things over to Courtney. All right, good afternoon. My name is Courtney Penn and I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions here at Roanoke College. Um, I'm really pleased to be with you this, this um, afternoon. Um, often say that outside of who and when you marry, your college choice is probably one of the most important decisions you make in your young life. So no pressure at all. But um, I, I hope that um, you're having a, 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 a wonderful college search. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Roanoke College. Um, Roanoke College is um, a school founded in 1842. Uh, we are the second oldest Lutheran founded college in the country. Um, located in Salem, Virginia, which is right next door to the city of Roanoke, not too far from our colleagues at Hollins University. Um, I think the best way I've described Roanoke College is that quintessential small school. We're 2,000 students at the undergraduate level and we're exclusively undergraduates, but we're that small school that's next to, um, that's in a small town that's next to a larger city that's under the mountains. And I think that really describes the um, the Roanoke College community well there. Um, we, are, um, we are a school that is extremely diverse. Um, we have students from 39 different um, states and 31 foreign countries. About half of our students are Virginians. Um, we have students that are extremely active. We operate in the Old Dominion Athletic Conference like my colleagues on the panel with me. Um, we have 22 Division III athletic teams, um, our newest athletic team um, that is um, being constituted this year is our men's wrestling program. Um, lots of academic opportunities at Roma. We have over 120 different academic options when you count our majors, minors, concentrations, and pre-professional programs. Almost anything that you'd want to do, you could find an opportunity to do at Rono. Um, in addition, um, we have over 100 clubs and organizations. I think one of our largest clubs is our, um, uh, is, is our outing club, um, which we called uh, Outdoor Adventure. Um, and um, I, I think being in the Roanoke Valley close to the Appalachian Trail and the Blue Ridge Parkway and the wonderful opportunities that this region provides um, just gives a great um, backdrop for that type of club. But we have clubs, um, you know, everything from beekeeping society to, um, um, to fraternities and sororities. In fact, we have five fraternities, five sororities, about 20% of our student body um, operate within those, um, um, those Greek letter organizations as well. We've been very pleased to be ranked by the US News and World Report as a top liberal arts college for undergraduate teaching. Um, we also have um, been, um, have been promoted uh, as a, um, um, top Fulbright, um, Fulbright Scholar producer. We've had 17 Fulbright Scholars in the last six years. And I, I don't believe there's other private colleges, um, you know, in our region that, um, that has been able to do that just yet. Um, we are a residential campus with 26 different residential facilities on campus and housing is guaranteed for all four years. Um, at the college. Um, we hope that you will have an opportunity to come and visit us at some point in the near future. All right, uh, so uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Um, my name is Thomas McKenna. I'm the Associate Director for Admissions at Shenandoah University. Uh, so just a, a quick kind of introduction. Uh, Shenandoah is a, uh, like Ashley mentioned, uh, a private university uh, right here in the state of Virginia. We're in the northern part of the Shenandoah Valley, so uh, just about an hour and a half due west of Washington, D.C. Um, we are also a smaller size institution, so we have around 2,100 undergraduate students, uh, but our total enrollment with our graduate programs included uh, is right around 4,000. Um, so 
uh, really number of different things uh, that our students are doing on campus. We have over 80 different academic uh, uh, programs that students that are in their first year are able to pursue as, an, as a, a program of study. Uh, some of our most popular uh, areas of study are um, nursing, uh, pre-health professions programs. Uh, Shenandoah offers a number of different graduate degrees in programs like physical therapy, athletic training, pharmacy, um, physician's assistant. Uh, and our students have opportunities to start in a pre-pathway at the undergraduate level that will uh, get them to those graduate degrees. Uh, many of those pathways include a fast track option where students can actually uh, cut off some time that they're in school. Uh, we also have a world-renowned uh, conservatory, a performing arts conservatory. That's how a lot of people know Shenandoah's name. Uh, we offer 14 different majors across music, theater, and dance, including a top 10 nationally ranked musical theater program. Uh, so we have really high level performances on campus all, uh, at all times, about 400 performances a year. So there's always something going on with our, within our performing arts conservatory. Um, last year, we actually uh, got to welcome in our largest incoming freshman class ever, uh, right around 518 students, which was really exciting. Uh, so Shenandoah is uh, slowly growing year to year, uh, but what I love about it is it's a really sustained growth uh, as our student body grows, so do the resources that we offer for our students. So we've been able to uh, increase our, our enrollment every year with uh, maintaining about a 10 to 1, 11 to 1 students teacher ratio. Average class size is typically around 18 to 20 students. Um, across the board for all of our different majors. Um, we are just like uh, you heard, we're also a residential campus. So 90% of our incoming freshmen every year do live right here on our main campus in Winchester. Uh, we also guarantee housing for all four years, including some cool opportunities at the upperclassmen level where it's on campus or off campus apartments in the local Winchester area. Uh, so a bunch of different things that students are doing with student life. Uh, we have over 90 different clubs and organizations on campus. Really, the only things that we don't offer are Greek life uh, organizations, so we don't have uh, traditional sororities or fraternities on campus. We do offer uh, service based and academic fraternities, uh, but then we have a number of other ways that students are involved, including uh, social based clubs, uh, academic clubs, as well as service based organizations. Um, athletics is a big part of campus life. Probably about one fourth of our students are student athletes, uh, and, and like Roanoke, we also have 22 varsity teams that compete in the uh, Old Dominion Athletic Conference with uh, wrestling being our most recent. This is wrestling's first season at Shenandoah, which is really exciting to see them kick off. Um, we have a very diverse student body. Uh, last year, our uh, incoming freshman class, uh, our students of color, were over 30% uh, overall as an institution. Uh, we're about 21% students of color. So that's something that we are intentionally looking to uh, improve every year uh, and provide more opportunities for students that come from different backgrounds. Um, we have 47 states represented, as well as uh, many different countries around the world represented on campus, uh, too. So um, application process is fairly simple. Uh, we work on rolling admissions. Students are welcome to apply at any point throughout the year. Uh, and typically, we get a decision back to our students uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and financial aid, merit-based scholarships are guaranteed for all students uh, that are accepted to Shenandoah. So. Uh, we're open for visits, so I encourage you to come up uh, and, and check us out. Uh, that uh, QR code that's on this page links right to our visit page, so we can talk about some of our on-campus visit opportunities as well as our virtual visit opportunities if you're unable to make it out to campus. So, And I'll pass it over to Jason at Hampton City. Awesome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Ferguson. I'm the Dean of Admission here at Hampton Sydney. I'm a graduate of Hampton Sydney. Uh, graduated back in 96 and uh, have been uh, in the Office of, Admi of Admission since I graduated. So uh, I went from not wanting to go to a men's college uh, to being uh, the Dean of Admissions of my alma mater. Uh, so it is a, a wonderful place to be. Uh, we throw the word brotherhood around. Uh, it's easy as a men's college to say brotherhood, uh, but I would take that a step further. And, and much like my colleagues have mentioned, I think the smaller schools really offer a family, uh, a familial experience where you get to know not only your faculty and your staff, uh, but your your classmates as well. Uh, there's some there's some interactions that you have at our level uh, that are second to none. So uh, I encourage you to consider all of us. Uh, as you can see, we were founded back in 1776. We predate the country, um, which is pretty cool. We're the 10th oldest college in the United States. Um, we have a high success rate with our with our graduates. Uh, if you see the outcomes, we have 94% of our guys who have uh, the ability to graduate on time will graduate on time. And the average starting salary for those men is uh, right at 53,000. So we're, we're pretty proud about the product that we put out. Uh, again, we're small, uh, 10 to one student to faculty ratio. So again, you're gonna get to know your 
faculty members very well. Uh, as you might imagine, my nickname is Ferg. Uh, I've been Ferg since I was in kindergarten. And uh, there are people on this campus who have no idea my first name is Jason, uh, which I, I quite like. Uh, so as a student, if they know you by your nickname, you can rest assured you, you will be able to ask your questions. Um, we talk about character building at Hampton Sydney, uh, something that, that goes along with the educational process here. Uh, we do uh, hold true to our mission of forming good men and good citizens. And so when you leave us, we wanna make sure that you go out uh, into your community, whether you're moving back home, whether you're moving to a new city, whether you're moving to a new country, uh, we wanna make sure that you are the pillar of your community. You're the deacon in your church, the scout leader, the little league coach. Uh, we want uh, our men to be visible and civic minded. So we, we build that into our educational experience here. Uh, we too are a member of the ODAC. Uh, it's, a, it's a great conference uh, to be in for, for all sports. It's a very competitive conference. Uh, and, and about a quarter of our guys do play uh, one of our varsity sports. And as you can imagine, as a men's college, uh, we have about 90% of our guys playing either a, var a club or a intramural sport. Um, and if you're not an athlete, that's fine, too. Uh, that One of the great things about small schools and, and the conference we're in, uh, being a spectator uh, takes on a different um, mindset with us. You're not just a fan. Uh, you're right on the action and can really be a, a supporter for your classmates. Uh, I listed some of our uh, Princeton review rankings, uh, which you can see there. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud about uh, a lot of those. And uh, again, I think that uh, as, as Thomas mentioned, you know, the best way to see us or the best way to see all of us is, is to visit. Uh, we all with COVID are doing different things now. So it's worth getting on our websites and checking those out. Uh, some of us can accommodate you in person. Some of us are having to do it virtually. Uh, I mean, y'all know the world we're living in, but we want to, we want to connect with you. We want to engage. Uh, so uh, as you leave here, uh, you know, please make sure you, you check, check us out. The last thing I will say, um, one thing that I think Ham Sydney does very well is we, we give guys confidence. Uh, you know, Ashley mentioned uh, women empowering women, and I think that's uh, important for, for our side as well. Um, I call it confidence. Uh, my wife will call it swagger. Uh, you can you know, call it what you want, uh, but I think that confidence can mean a lot of things. There's academic confidence, there's social confidence, um, there are things that, you know, all of us need uh, to get out and make sure that, you know, we're doing the best we can to be the best person we can be. And, uh, and I feel that Ham Sydney does a good job of that. Uh, we've launched a new website uh, to that nature. If you, you see the bottom, the swagablog.com, uh, I suggest all you guys check that out. Uh, it's not the official college website, but it's a, a cool place to kind of see some of the things that we're doing and some of the things that our guys are in, engaged with. Uh, so just check that out. All right, um, um, it's my task today to talk a little bit about holistic review. And, um, you know, I'll be talking about really what it, what it means, uh, what holistic review means and, uh, and factors that shape um, an admissions decision. And I'll also talk some about why it's important. Um, but um, um, before I do that, I, you know, I can't tell you how many students I talk to during this process and they are extremely stressed. Um, through this admissions process. And I asked them, you know, what is so stressful about this process and, you know, whether I'm going to get in and, or not. And, and so many times it seems that, um, that self-worth sometimes is connected to acceptance places. And, uh, you know, and I want to emphasize that that is not exactly the question um, in many um, review processes. Um, you are you and you are great how you are and there is a place for you. And, um, and the key to this search process is just having a, a wide enough search that you find the right place for you. Um, and, um, and that's what I you know, hope that um, you will um, purpose to do as your, as your process. And I, I tell students all the time that you're going to college next year, you're not going to jail. So, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, the good, it's all good um, wherever you end up. But um, let me share this definition with you about holistic review. And it's one of the better ones I've found. And truthfully, it came from the American Association of Medical Colleges that, um, um, that generally have been um, out ahead of even undergraduate institutions when it comes to this process of holistic review. And 
And the definition here is the mission aligned, and I'll say that again, the mission aligned uh, admission or selection process um, that takes into consideration the applicant's experiences, attributions, uh, academic metrics, and as well as the value an applicant would contribute. Um, I, I think I think that um, that says so many things. I had a pop up there. I think that says it really well um, that it is mission aligned, meaning that um, the the institution it's aligned with their mission and who they're looking for to strengthen, you know what they believe is best for them in that particular year. Um, and it needs to be aligned for you, that this institution provides you the things that you believe will provide um, um, for your success in the future. So this is mission aligned for the institution and mission aligned for you. I think one of the best ways I can describe um, a holistic review is to kind of make the analogy back to uh, an athletic team. Now, I mean, if you, if you think of a, um, a soccer team and as a um, coach or um, athletic um, uh, association is putting together an athletic team, they are looking for certain pieces of that athletic team to make a whole, um, especially a soccer team. You need a couple of goalkeepers. Um, you need some forwards. Um, you need mid middies. You need defensive. Um, so what holistic review is all about is putting together a team um, that can be best associated uh, for the college. So there are many factors that, um, that, that shape the admissions decisions. I mean, and you guys know of all of these here, you know that your grades and, um, and the GPA and the curriculum that you take on, um, meaning how rigorous your curriculum is and how you do um, as you take on that, that curriculum. Um, possibly whether or not you take these AP courses versus dual degrees or versus regular courses. And, and even sometimes how do you score on your AP exams in the process? Um, and then the, the old adage of the ACT and SAT scores that you take and uh, those um, generally play, play a role as well. Um, um, this year, of course, with uh, College Board and ACT being so difficult to get, most colleges have moved to test optional, which means that um, they're going to put a lot more emphasis on other parts of your, uh, of your, um, of your application package. Um, then there's these non-academic factors, um, such as your essay, um, maybe even your recommendations uh, that you're able to present. All of these give college colleges a good picture of who you are. And then we look deeper into what you've done with your experiences. You know, we're looking at the leadership experiences that you've had um, and the passions that you've had. I think there's a common misconception that colleges are looking for well-rounded students. And, and I think that's great when you have that student that does a little bit of everything and just does it super well. I mean, that's, that's great, but that's a rarity. But we're looking for people. And I think colleges are looking for folks who are passionate about certain things. Um, and, they, and they go into depth um, in those areas of passion and they make them a part of their lives. And, and it's that type of engagement and passion that really um, drives colleges. And um, so when you get to that college, you're able to live that passion on that particular campus. We also look at things that um, have been in your past that may hinder some of your progress um, and um, your resilience in spite of some of those aspects. Um, I read an essay not too long ago of a student who, um, whose parents have both um, contracted um, COVID-19 and one parent unfortunately passed away and you know, their family is really trying to reel from that experience. And, um, and basically the essay said, listen, my grades are not gonna look that great this semester, um, but I want you to know why. And, you know, so that really, you know, told me a lot of things about that student. Uh, so your story 
you know, is an important factor um, in this. And I, you know, I encourage you not to skimp on your story because as an admissions officer, we want to know um, in the holistic review process. Um, we want to know. Um, so why, why is this so important? Um, and, and I should probably say that not every school engages in this holistic review process. And I can safely say that the schools that are on the, the call today are places that really do um, review applications holistically. But I'm sure you understand that there are schools that they just receive so many applications and you know, they need to review applications a little bit more generally. But you're generally talking about schools that sometimes are smaller, sometimes are a little bit more selective uh, that are gonna engage in this type of uh, process. But it really ensures that you are the center of the process. Um, and, um, and it allows you to tell your story. Um, but at the end of all of this, the guaranteed outcome is that you will be invited to participate in the campus where that admissions team has really already determined that you will make a wonderful contribution, that you would thrive there, uh, and that after four years of experience with them, that you will be better for it and make that institution better as well. So that, that in an instance is really what holistic review is all about. Um, it's about making you the center of the process, um, and you may want to even allow opportunities for you to visit and to do some of this selling of yourself in person if there is an opportunity to do that, either in person or through Zoom calls or whatever the opportunity may provide. Um, but um, I thank you for the opportunity to let me tell you just a little bit about Holistic Review. I love to answer some questions about it and as the um, session goes on, but I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to talk about some of the other sessions. All right, thank you, Courtney. I think that was a great uh, kind of intro to what Holistic Review is uh, and ties in nicely with this next section here talking about uh, test optional uh, and, and what that really means for students as you're navigating this applica application process to, to the various colleges you're working with. Um, so. Uh, first off, uh, test optional, I think, is, is oftentimes used as an umbrella term uh, to speak about uh, schools that don't necessarily require an SAT or an ACT score to make an admission decision. Uh, but there are a couple differences to policies that schools will use. So I just have brief uh, definitions here about some of those. Uh, so the first is just test optional as is. Uh, so what that means is applicants can choose to submit test scores, but those test scores aren't required for an admission decision. So uh, many schools will still welcome them uh, and use them in the review process, uh, going back to that holistic review where we're going to take all the information that you send us and uh, consider everything that we have before making an admission decision. Um, but you don't necessarily have to send them in if you weren't able to take the test or you weren't pleased with your scores, uh, you have that option to submit them uh, or not. Um, Sometimes that comes with supplemental requirements where if you decide not to submit a test score, there are other materials that you may have to submit in place of those test scores like an essay. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as you are working with schools who are test optional. The next here is test blind. Uh, what test blind means is even if you send them in, the colleges will not use your test scores to, uh, during the admissions review. Uh, so for test blind policies, it's rare that there will be a supplement, supplemental requirement in place of it unless it's already identified as a required material of the application, uh, but the schools just aren't considering those test scores uh, in the review process. Um, and then the final one here is text flexible or test flexible. Um, so basically text, fle fle test flexible uh, means that applicants are welcome to submit uh, other scores in place of the SAT or ACT. This is one that you probably will see less commonly than the other two, um, but, but uh, and sometimes they'll allow you to submit an SAT subject test, an IB exam, or AP exam in specific subject areas uh, to replace those SAT or ACT scores. Um, so next I want to talk about kind of what uh, the impact on, on higher education as a whole and college admission policies uh, has been because uh, uh, or of surrounding test optional policies. Uh, first, it, COVID-19 has really been kind of a catalyst for many schools deciding to move test optional. 
Um, as of, I have uh, just a quick fact I want to share with you guys here. As of September 10th, 2020, two thirds of all US four year colleges and universities moved to test optional or test blind for fall 2021 applicants. Um, now, this doesn't mean that all of those colleges and universities will maintain that test optional or test blind policy moving forward, but I think that you'll find that many will continue to adapt that as their uh, overall review policy. So it's just something to keep an eye on for years moving forward. Uh, COVID-19 uh, impacted us in a number of different ways. Uh, one of those specific to your college admission search being many of the SAT or ACT dates in the early parts of the spring or early parts of the summer were canceled or postponed. Uh, and many students as they finished up their junior year moving into their senior year did not have that option to take the SAT or prepare for it like they would have liked to. Uh, so in response to that, I think that's one of the main reasons that you've seen many colleges have decided to make this change now. Um, full disclosure, this has been something that at Shenandoah we've actually been talking about for a number of years. Uh, we've put some research into it, um, really behind the idea of equity versus equality uh, and what the test scores actually represent. Um, and we uh, did some specific research to show whether or not test scores really were an indicator of a student's potential or ability to be successful in college and beyond. Um, or if it was just a, a kind of a, a, a loop that we were making students jump through uh, to uh, apply and be admitted to colleges. And what we found was there was a, a direct correlation between student GPA and their potential success in terms of re student retention uh, and graduation rates, but there was not a direct correlation between test scores and those uh, different factors uh, that contribute to success. So. Um, there were students who had strong GPAs but lower test scores who really were very successful uh, and students who had lower GPAs and higher test scores and there weren't there was not a positive impact that those test scores had on their uh, kind of metrics that we were able to measure so um, so this has been something that we've been considering for a long time and at Shenandoah we you know used uh, COVID as a way to really make that switch uh, and it is something that we are going to continue as a, as a policy moving forward um, and like Courtney said, during the holistic review, we are now really just considering other parts of your application uh, more in depth. So, um, you know, we are, are considering your strength of curriculum, uh, how you performed throughout high school. We believe that's a much uh, stronger indicator of your potential for success in college uh, than, uh, than the test, uh, either the SAT or the ACT would be. Um, and, and I think a lot of times those, and back to the equity versus equality, a lot of times, you know, the uh, there's been research done that showed that while SAT and ACT are meant as an indicator of a student's kind of intellectual ability or preparedness for college success, they oftentimes reflect socioeconomic imbalance. And what I mean by that is students who um, maybe don't have the same resources to help them prepare for these standardized tests uh, like others in more affluent communities or in school districts where uh, there's, there's more resources put in place for those students to help prepare them for these type of exams. Um, so uh, we found that uh, by removing that requirement, it's, it's opened up the potential for students who are really strong in the classroom, but maybe struggle on standardized tests uh, to still have the same opportunities that other students who have those resources do. So, and then finally here, how does this affect you? Um, there's a, a common uh, theme that I've noticed with students I've worked with in the early parts of this year where um, even though we are saying test optional or test blind in many cases, uh, students feel like they may still be at a disadvantage if they do not submit the SAT or the ACT. Uh, and uh, you're not. Uh, that just to, as, as a kind of a, a quick answer, you will not be at a disadvantage. I have a quote here from uh, the National Association for College Admissions Counseling, uh, which was part of a letter back in uh, August. Um, due to the cancellation of SAT and AS ACT testing dates, more than 1,200 U.S. colleges and universities announced they are moving to a test optional policy, and more will surely follow. Uh, by going test optional, institutions are making a definitive statement that they will not need test scores to make admissions decisions this year. Uh, despite the change in policies, high school counselors and their parents are asking, does test optional really mean test optional? Uh, the an answer, simply put, is yes. The following colleges will be test optional policies in place. Uh, to affirm that they will not penalize students for the absence of standardized test scores. Um, so what that means for you all is know that as you navigate the college application process, if you do not, if you had not had the opportunity to take the SAT or the ACT, you will not be penalized for that. We will still be able to review your application and give you an admission decision based on what you've done uh, throughout your four years of high school. 
Uh, next, I will just encourage you, do your research. Make sure you understand what different colleges are looking for, uh, because while many colleges, as I pointed out, have switched test optional policies, that may not be the case for all. Others may have a preference that you submit the SAT, and if so, um, utilize uh, resources like all of us here today in, in our admissions offices. That's why we're here, to help you as you navigate this process. So call us, ask us questions, make sure you understand what we're looking for, um, and we're going to give you honest answers uh, to make sure you're prepared and, and know what to look for as you're going through this whole process. Um, understand the timeline and requirements for each individual schools um, uh, and understand you know, that, that potential that there may be supplemental or optional materials that you can submit to really help us get that, that holistic view of you uh, as a student, as a person, uh, as we go through this uh, um, application review process. Because I think this year, more, uh, even more so than other years in the past, uh, the holistic review is going to play a big part in, in the application uh, review and decision-making process. Uh, and then final note I have here is just make sure to understand whether or not submitting your SAT or ACT can have an impact on merit-based scholarships. Um, at Shenandoah, uh, just like my other examples, we are not, it will not impact your merit-based scholarships at all. We've moved to uh, only using uh, the academic record through high school to form our, our merit-based scholarships for students. Um, so, but that's just something to keep in mind and to ask as you are going through the application process so you have an understanding of that. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I'll hand it over to Ashley to cover uh, her section here. Thank you. Um, so now that you've heard so much about what a private education can, can offer to you, I want to talk a little bit about affordability. I'm certain when you get on our websites and you look at the cost of tuition and room and board, like most students, the first reaction is, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to afford that. Um, and I think it's important for you to know that what you see listed on the site is not what students pay. And I know that feels a little odd, but um, it's the nature of the world that we're in. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of three different buckets that you can look to to help make a private education affordable. Everybody does it a little bit different, but these are kind of um, overarching tips that will help you uh, kind of decode um, your scholarship and financial aid letter when you do get it. So the first important bucket for you to be aware of are these academic merit-based aid. And you've heard several of us mention this. So these are scholarships that we offer to students based on your academic performance in high school. So this is where your grades do matter, your grades and your rigor. Um, most of us use some kind of a sliding scale uh, to assess how your profile compares to peers in the applicant pool and then award scholarship dollars um, as a part of that. Um, this is one big difference when you compare public and private universities. Generally, if you're applying to a private university, in particular one that is um, like moderately selective, you can count on some merit aid from that school. Whereas when you're looking at the public universities here in the Commonwealth, um, traditionally you won't be offered as much or maybe any um, merit-based aid at those schools. So that's one big, one big significant way that private universities work to make uh, this experience affordable for you. Um, many of us also have additional scholarships for things like leadership on campus, for special talents that you might have. Perhaps you're really um, engaged in music or theater um, so I would suggest that as you narrow your, your search, once you know where you're in, you should reach out to your admissions officer and say, hey, you know, are there additional um, application-based scholarships that I might be considered for? So generally, your application for admission is going to be sufficient for you to be evaluated for academic merit scholarship. You typically don't need anything else beyond those, those materials to receive that scholarship, um, but there may be additional monies that you could be considered for. So um, your counselor will be a great person to chat with. They know you and they can help guide you about the application process for that because those are, are different at every school. Um, the second big bucket that we want to know and talk about is the federal aid that you can, can qualify for um, and also the university aid that's associated with that for, for need. So first bucket is academic merit that's based on your academic performance. Second bucket is based on the results of your FAFSA. So FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's available now. It went live on October 1st. And it is using your family's financial history from two years ago to uh, produce a figure called the Estimated Family Contribution, or EFC. And that's what the federal government believes your family can afford to pay for university. 
Um, sometimes it's uh, close and other times people feel like it's a real stretch. So um, one important thing for you to know in particular in the era of COVID-19 is, is just what I said about the fact that the FAFSA is looking at your family's tax information from two years ago. Well, two years ago, coronavirus wasn't a thing, right? Um, so we know that the, your immediate financial situation could look very different from what it did um, two years ago. I've already talked to many students who uh, family had to close a business or somebody was laid off, really hard economic impacts as a result of COVID-19. Um, and colleges and universities can do a financial appeal on your behalf to the, to the federal FAFSA um, that could help you realize both additional federal aid and additional university-based aid. So I know those conversations are hard and uncomfortable, but that's where it's really important for you to think of us as admission officers, as your advocate. It's our job to help you if we can. And we really deeply want to see you at these places and we want to help you make it affordable. So um, please do reach out if any of those situations apply to you. Um, we all have different kind of strategies and approaches in terms of how much of your need we will be able to meet. So um, need meaning the difference between what, what the true cost is to attend and what the, what the government says you can afford. So um, that, that's a good question for you to ask at schools on your list. What percent of need do you meet? Uh, and that can give you a sense of what your financial aid package might look like even before you have the letter in hand. Um, really quickly, I wanted to just make sure everybody has a, a base level understanding of the difference between grants, loans, and scholarships. So if you see something on your aid letter called a grant, grant means free money, whether it's offered by the college or by the federal government, it's free money that you don't have to pay back. Um, very similar to scholarship. So kind of different, different things, but they mean the same thing for you in terms of free money and you want them. <laughs> uh, and then the loans, that's the thing that, um, if you submit the FAFSA as a student, every student who submits the FAFSA is offered $5,500 in federal student loans. And it's up to you and your family as to whether or not you think you need them to help you afford college. Um, payments aren't required until six months after you graduate and you do have the opportunity to defer payments if you end up going to graduate school. Um, there are some great calculators online on the federal financial aid website where you can put in, you know, if I borrow this, then um, I will receive this in terms of what your payment will be. And then the last thing you want to look into are scholarships in your community. So don't just ask your counselor, look at where your parents work. Go to um, scholarship sites like Niche and scholarships.com and the Opportunity College Board site to look for scholarships that fit your credentials. Um, there are special scholarships out there that have very specific criteria and you don't know till you look. So my pro tip there is to develop um, a separate email account specifically for your scholarship search. Because in addition to the good stuff, you're going to get some spammy stuff. So if you have an additional account, it won't clog your main email address that you're using for your important college communications. So I see we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Jason. So I've been keeping up with the questions in the chat, and I appreciate uh, all of those questions. The one that I, I, I sort of throw out there, one of the questions was, um, all of us seem to represent smaller schools and, and what is the one thing that you guys do better I would say is the main reason to choose your school over a larger school that the larger schools promise a holistic review say that they're cheaper and they're test optional um the, the answer i'd give in the, in the last minute we have before we got to let you guys go is there's there's a reason that those larger schools say those things uh they're trying to offer you what we have all been talking about uh for the past 45 minutes uh there's a reason they're saying that they can be a small school. So the 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 caution I would give you is to, to make sure you look into those statements. Uh, but the, the the advice I would give you is what my colleagues have said, really look into the smaller schools, uh, pay us a visit because everything we've said today, we've been doing for years. And uh, we know that uh, you would be a great addition to our campus and we look forward to seeing you on soon. And I see, like I said, I've kept up with the chat. I see we've got about a minute left. So if your question did not get answered, uh, all of us will get those uh, at the end of the session and we'll reach out to you guys individually. Um, but if you need anything, please contact us and let us know. Thank you to all of our panelists and all of the participants. 
We ask that, and thank you for joining us. We ask that you take a moment to take a quick survey um, that will appear. And then you would also consider signing up for more sessions. And I like that advice about not stressing. I know this is, just remember this is a journey and you need to not get too bogged down in stress. Enjoy the journey. Thank you, everyone. Oh, one more thing. Remember the a recording will be made available. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, thank you. Thank you.